afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Barometer Readings webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and joining me today, as always, is our Chief Investment Strategist and President, David Burroughs. On today's webcast, we will provide you with a brief macro overview, and of course, at the tail end of the conversation, David would be pleased to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can email me those questions to my email, phastings at barometercapital.ca, or please feel free to hit us up on the Q&A or the chat within the Zoom link. And with that, I turn the conversation on this last week of August to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Nice to see you. How are you? Just great. Thank you for moderating today. Always and, a pleasure, uh, Dave. And I'll thank everybody for joining us. Um, you know, the last week of August is always a tricky week. I can't tell you how many times I've I've been in front of my screen watching markets gyrate. But there's a few things we got to keep in mind. One, it is the last week of August. There's a ton of people away. Liquidity in the market is not very deep. Uh, and certainly, you know, seasonally, this can be a bit of a tricky time. Uh, last week, the big news, of course, was, uh, was uh, Fed Chair Powell speaking at Jackson Hole. Uh, and once again, as we've talked about before, he used the bully pulpit uh, to make it clear that people should be careful about how much money they're spending because he's going to be tough on rates and they are not going to roll over on inflation. So clearly the market took that as a signal that he's not ready to pivot. And he wouldn't want the market to think that he's ready to pivot because frankly, that's the tool he's using to try and pair demand and let the supply chain catch up. Um, but nonetheless, whether the market's liquid or not, there's messages that we can take away. We got lots to talk about. Uh, we're going to try and take some signaling from the market uh, and get a view as to where things stand and, and where we are on this on this roadmap. So uh, just quickly, um, let's let's just go from the top. Uh, as as most people know, we believe we're in a structural bull market in equities, which we've been in since 2013. And while there's lots of ups and downs along the way, it's generally sort of three steps forward, one step back. Uh, the declines can be painful though, and we don't want to don't want to uh, uh, make them invalid, they are, they are painful and we have to deal with them, but not quite the same as what we see in a structural bear market like 2000 uh, through 2003 or 2008-9, or going back to the 70s, 1973-74. At this point, we just really don't think that the conditions are in place uh, to support that. At this point, uh, while certainly you know credit conditions are tighter, uh, we are not seeing any sign of, of a real credit crisis. Uh, spreads continue to be, uh, you know, within within what has been a typical range uh, in a in a garden variety uh, a correction recession. So uh, at this point, you know, we continue to believe that many of the many of the signposts point to the fact that we're in a correction, much like other corrections during a structural bull market, and they they are a combination of time and price, uh, and they are necessary, but they set up the next very significant run higher in price. And certainly the markets would like to see Fed Chair Powell get a hold of inflation. We're not entirely sure that we are going back to the world that we've been in for the last four decades. We think we are in a reflationary environment and we're gonna see sort of higher highs and higher lows in rates. And speaking of that, uh, you know, we believe that we saw the, the, the generational bottoming in interest rates in 2020. And certainly we had a, a sharp run up in all yields from two years out to 30 years. Uh, and as of a few weeks ago, the 10 year got as high as 3.4%. We thought perhaps maybe this needed to consolidate a little bit after making this breakout. And certainly we've done that. But you can see after a few weeks trading above that declining long-term moving average markets starting to strengthen again. In other words, yields working their way higher at 3.11 as of printing this chart this afternoon. Uh, and, uh, and this clearly points to a change in the trend that we have been in since 1980. On commodities, we talked about the relative outperformance of commodities since 2020, and that really has continued. There's the RJI or equally weighted commodities index. Um, and, you know, at the end of the equity sell-off or toward the lows in, in July, at June, we saw weakness in May and early June. 
uh, in this equally weighted basket, uh, but we've certainly seen strength since then. So there's the near-term picture of the commodity index. This is relative strength versus the S&P 500. And it's important to recognize when there's been a structural shift that commodities index underperformed equities from 2009 through until 2020 or 11 years. And since 2020 have been relatively outperforming equities. Look, at the end of the day, we all have a choice as to where position or where to position our investments. Equities can be an excellent place to be. But so can commodities if we're in a world where stuff goes up in price. Uh, and there has been a structural deficit created in all kinds of different commodities that is not easy to fix. So we believe basically that fixed income is a less friendly place to be going forward. It will certainly have its spots in difficult markets and in down cycles. Equities continue to be a favorable spot, but certain neighborhoods within equities more favorable than others. And commodities as an asset class or basic materials is a viable one and underowned and underappreciated by most investors. Probably the best risk reward of those three major asset classes. And then the fourth asset class I'll just highlight, we don't spend a lot of time talking about is real estate. And of course, real estate was a huge beneficiary of falling interest rates over the last 40 years that enabled uh, higher and higher pricing. And probably that is challenged going forward. So the difficulty is that there are asset classes that people really get to love because they work for a long time. And at some point you get these structural shifts and you have to recognize it and be prepared to reposition your investment portfolios, whether it's in public market securities or, or assets like real estate. So within commodities, Brent crude and WTI have been in particular very, very strong. Uh, this is the relative price strength versus the S&P since the beginning of the year. In fact, it's been firming up since partway through 2020. We're still trading above long-term moving averages. Certainly, Brent pulled back today about 5%. Uh, European energy may have got a little bit ahead of itself. We talked about what's been going on in the natural, natural gas and energy markets. But there's a structural deficit, and it's going to be very difficult to supply the market going forward, given the small amount of spending on new drilling and new, new activity. When we look at a point and figure chart of WTI, these are the December futures. It's, it's really interesting. So of course, on a point and figure chart, when you're rising in price, you mark it out in X's, falling in price, mark it out in zeros. And of course, we like to see higher highs and higher lows. Well, after the market corrected from the spring, we saw a nice bottoming process and we again began higher highs and higher lows. So technically very attractive because we've gone through a consolidation or a correction as it stands. The point and figure chart is very attractive. Uh, and certainly again, this continues to be a sector that's not well loved. Now last week we put this chart up and we talked about the fact that OPEC would like to target a price range between 90 and say $120, enough that they do very well and make a lot of money, but not so much that it's going to kill demand. A lot of people believe that demand starts to get hurt at sort of $125 or $130 a barrel. We're nowhere close to that. In fact, we're at the bottom end of the band. <clears throat> I think that today's reaction in the market was some view that perhaps uh, changes in Iraq could help loosen up the market. I think that that's unlikely. In fact, OPEC is talking about <clears throat> perhaps curtailing some production, not adding new production. Uh, so you have to give the benefit of the doubt to the long-term trend, which is certainly positive. Um, there's agricultural prices. This is again, relative strength on the bottom. You can see through the course of the rally from the June lows, we've seen regular outperformance versus stocks. That's what we like to see. And of course, the question we have had is, Great, the market may be put in a low in June. We'll see whether that's a lasting low. We believe that it likely is, but certainly there were gonna be pullbacks. And when there were pullbacks, what would hold up in price and what would pull back more than the market? And certainly commodities have held in very, very well relative to stocks and outperformed stocks, both in the rally and in the recent pullback. So 
we use tools to help us identify which neighborhoods to focus in. We can focus in all kinds of different asset classes and geographic regions and sectors and themes, but we want to own the ones that other people apparently also want to own. And we measure that by trying to identify those neighborhoods within our investable universe that are seeing improvement in breadth over time, meaning more and more securities are participating in the rally. We know that if we get the asset class right and the sectors and themes, well, that's 80% of returns being in the right neighborhood. 20% of return is finding securities, specific ones within those groups to express our view. And in most of the portfolios we run, we use single shot or individual securities to express those views. In our macro portfolios, we use ETFs and we use our bottom up process to try to identify securities that are good getting better, where the fundamental characteristics are strong to begin with, where technically they're sound and there's agreement between the technical outlook and the fundamental outlook and they're behaving the way they should be given what we think we know. From a breadth perspective, we like to see over time as a market or a sector or a theme makes a bottoming process, we wanna see an expanding number of securities in that group participating in a rally. That's constructive. There's no bear market ever took place while you're seeing expanding breadth. When breadth starts to contract, it doesn't mean everything's gonna sell off. Sometimes it does, but it does mean we need to be more careful and we need to be prepared maybe to raise a little bit of cash. If this is a specific theme that's seeing deterioration in breadth, we maybe wanna reduce our weights we certainly don't want to add any new positions until we see that relationship start to shift. So we run models across about 300 different universes of securities to try to identify the groups that are seeing expanding breadth where the risk reward is in our favor, where we've got the wind at our back. Our job isn't to be everywhere. It's to be focused in areas of market leadership. We got to recognize change, new leadership as it emerges or old leadership as it recedes. And if there is no leadership, well, we better be on the sidelines and wait for a better opportunity. So lots of different approaches to things, but ours is quite tactical. And the goal here is to take advantage of strength and be prepared to step aside when things get sloppy. Now, at the end of June, the breadth models that we use were solidly negative. Percent of stocks in uptrends in Canada, the US, and globally had been declining. It meant that we were, had been more cautious, that we had a larger cash weight, and that we were reticent about putting new positions on. The shorter term indicators, percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average for each of those three areas had been declining, but were getting extremely oversold. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum had been declining. Percent of stocks making new highs versus those that were making new lows was getting to an extreme low level at around 10%. And the percent of stocks trading above their 150 day or their longer term trend moving average and also had got to an extreme level. So what happened? Well, things certainly turned positive in around the middle of June and we rallied very sharply over less than 50 days to where we got to the declining 200 week moving average and this declining trend line that had been in place since the beginning of the correction. This was about three weeks ago. And in that weekly call, we said, look, a lot of companies are trading and extended a long way above their 50-day moving average. The S&P was over 8% above the 50-day moving average. And often when that was the case, you might get some near-term correction. Paired with the fact that we were working our way into August, and seasonally a more difficult time, we thought, despite the fact that things had certainly shown improvement in our breadth models, it was possible we could see some pullback. And when we looked at a study that looked at the data of all the times where the market had become more than 7% above the 50-day moving average, but still below the 200-day from 1950 to the present, over the next few weeks, often there was some correction. So in 1988, over the next two weeks, he pulled back 7%. In, in 2001, after two months, you'd pulled back 6.5%. In fact, after three, 8%. And after six months, 11%. That's the biggest outlier. So what's happened? Well, we certainly have pulled back. 
the S&P has pulled back 8.2% over the last two weeks. It's not every company that's done it. And some groups have behaved better than others. That's why we don't just look at an index, but we look at what's happening within the index to get some clues. Now, this is a valuable time because when, when markets pull back after an initial push higher, as I said earlier, we want to know what holds up in price. That probably represents where there was real buying taking place. And what is it that gives back the gains quickly? Because that may help us to see where there was simply short covering taking place. As we sit today, our indicators are mixed. Um, this is, sorry, as of last week, the long-term picture was positive. The short-term indicators were mixed. Now, we talked about the fact that when you got to the point where more than 90% of the S&P traded above their 50-day over a very short period of time, it was a very bullish signal. And that 10 days out, 21 days out, or one trading month, two months out, three months out, the numbers got very, very compelling, despite the fact there might be really negative news in the market. If you think about it, we're about 21 days out. And we've seen about an 8% pullback. This is where we should start to see some support. Now let's take the study one step further. S&P constituents greater than 15% um, from, from less than 15% of companies above their 50-day to 90% of companies above their 50-day within 50 days. And then the market pulls back and closes at a 20-day low. What happens next? Well, 10 days out, in general, markets were positive 67% of the time with some small negatives. A month out, again, small negatives, about 1%. But 42 days, that's two months, three months, six months, and one year, 100% of the occasions positive. Now, look, we don't make decisions based on that data, but it's important to understand what can happen from a specific situation. So, the S&Ps pulled back 8%. Let's look at some of the other subgroups. Well, this is the RPV ETF. It's the value component within the S&P 500. Okay, it pulled back. It's pulled back 4.7% or about half as much as the market. That's valuable information because relative strength has favored value as a factor since December of 2021 when this correction began. So value continues to appear to be leadership. But trading better than 90, sorry, 69% of companies in the S&P over the last 12 months, rising relative strength through the bounce and through the correction. There's value in mid-cap stocks, often more volatile than large caps, but again, pulled back 5.8% over the last 11 days with rising relative strength going through the process. So I would say broadly that value as a factor is one that the market favors currently. Let's look at the alternative to that. Let's look at growth versus the S&P. This is the NASDAQ 100, has had generally falling relative strength since November of last year. Certainly did have a bounce from June on, but over the last three weeks, has seen steadily declining relative price strength, now down 10.1% off the highs. So this tells me that this is not leadership, has not been leadership coming into the correction and has not been leadership since the correction, since the bounce. Taking it one step further, this is the ARKK or the innovation ETF made up of broadly unprofitable but promising technology companies. It's pulled back 21% in the last 12 days. So look, it's no fun being in a choppy market, but it's important to learn from it. And what I would say is when we talked two weeks ago and said we've added a little bit of technology to the portfolio, but still way underweight, we put a question mark on the QQQ as it was yet to prove itself. And my guess is what the market's telling us is they're not ready to buy long duration assets or to assume that long-term rates were gonna drop a lot. Now let's jump through uh, and talk about some of the data around, uh, around leadership. So 
XEG. This is a chart I put up almost every week for several months now. It's the TSX capped energy index. It's up 42% year to date, down today 3.6%. I think it was a little bit off that low by the end of the day. Trading better than 95% of companies in the S&P over the course of the year. Exactly what we wanted to see. When the market rallied, relative strength showed positive versus the market, meaning outperformed the market. And on the recent decline, acting much better than the market, continues to be leadership. Now, look, there's, there's things that help us to believe that energy could have a particularly long rally. We showed how energy has come out of a multi-year bear market going back to 2014, an eight-year bear market. During that time, lots of companies disappeared. There was lots of mergers and acquisitions. In the Canadian oil patch, we went from about 40 gas producers to about five major ones. So the industry certainly consolidated. But once the change begins and the sector starts to outperform, it often can go on a long time. As it sits right now, even though the energy sector has way outperformed the S&P over the last 18 months, it still represents only 4.8% weight in the S&P 500. Now, if we go back to the market of the late 1970s, it was 27% of the market. And I'm not suggesting that it's going back there but at 4.8%, we've just come from the point where energy was almost irrelevant to the majority of portfolio managers. If they were following an ESG uh, 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 constraint, then they were very happy not to be here. Now, once it becomes the best performing sector in the market, they're more interested. But if it's only 3% of the S&P, they don't have to worry about it so much. As the weight grows within the S&P, it opens the door to more and more portfolio managers who say, I really need to have some exposure because it's costing me. So only this to say at 4.8% of the S&P, there's a lot of portfolio managers still really not there. Now we talked a lot about oil and gas producers over the last couple of weeks. We talked about lithium last week. This week was a week for the uranium producers a giant jump in relative strength over the course of the week. In fact, I think Cameco was up about 30% in the last week. And it would make sense given the fact that we've got an energy crisis around the world, that many countries are reconsidering their stance on, on nuclear. And Cameco was the 600 pound gorilla in the room as a supplier. So this is a sector that seems to be getting a lift and certainly being brought along with the rest of the energy sector. Now, at the end of the day, oil and gas performance relative to tech stocks only just started to outperform over the last 18 months. And if it follows the path that it's followed before, it could go on for a long time. This, can go, this, this really probably is still very early in, in stage, and there will be pullbacks along the way. Outside of energy, we talked about industrials have, having really gained relative strength over the last few weeks, particular the defense stocks and Lockheed Martin being one of them now trading better than 88% of all the companies in the S&P. Again, much better relative strength going through this recent pullback, getting market tested. Financials. Financials continue to have stronger relative strength that started in May of this year. Breadth readings continue to be positive. And whether you're looking at regional banks or the large money center banks, or frankly, insurance companies, this is the insurance ETF, KIE, all of these doing what we would hope it would do in the course of a pullback. Certainly they're pulling back, but a lot less than the market. Let's move from financials to the big dividend payers. Uh, let's talk about staples. And certainly some of the financials are big dividend payers, but staples uh, doing exactly what we'd like to see and utilities trading better than 88% of companies in the S&P. Relative strength is outperformed on these going back to November. Now this is opens an important conversation. We spent a lot of time over the last two years talking about dividend growth as a cohort we want to focus on in a rising interest rate world. We know that in the 1950s and 60s, dividend growth stocks were the best performing part of the market as people looked for alternatives to fixed income, which of course is fixed income. Rates go higher, the yields on a bond don't. We need securities that will pay us a rising stream of cash flows. 
Now, we don't just have to buy dividend growth in a rising rate environment. They work in falling rates as well. If you take um, a cohort of dividend pairs, and this is the FDL, which is the Morningstar Dividend Leaders ETF, it pays a 3.4% yield and has grown its dividend about 8% a year over the last five years. Certainly behaving very, very well relative to the market. You can see only pulled back 3% while the market's pulled back 8 So very resilient. Okay, so let's talk about dividend growth as a strategy. These numbers are courtesy of RBC Capital Markets, and it's a study I've seen many times over the course of my life. Um, this takes data from 1986 to the present. And if you break the market up into five different cohorts, first, companies that have a history of growing their dividend, they've returned on average 10.7% a year since 1986. Dividend payers also quite attractive, up 9%. The TSX composite compounded at 6%. Dividend cutters are companies that were not able to maintain a dividend with considerably less return at 3.2 and non-dividend payers at half of 1% a year. Well, that's a story in itself. But the better story is if you pair that with volatility data. So if we look at annualized volatility, dividend growers have far less volatility than certainly non-payers or cutters or the TSX. So this truly is a free lunch, better return with less volatility. So the investment team at Barometer has spent many, many years building a framework to identify companies with an, with an improving ability to pay with very strong fundamental characteristics that allow them to have excess capital that they can return to shareholders. And then the shareholders decide what they want to do with it. But in a rising interest rate world, dividend growth becomes that much more important. And I'd like to slice this up in future into periods when rates were rising or rates were falling. And I believe the data is even more compelling during rising rates. But that's a pretty compelling story. Dividend growth versus dividend payers versus the index itself, versus non-payers. So the dividend theme is alive and well. Relative strength has remained very, very strong going through this most recent pullback and continues to be considered market leadership. Let's talk about materials for a second. The metals and mining stocks, nice re rising relative strength over the last couple of weeks and relative strength rising since November 2020. We, we looked at the long-term picture, which is only just out of a structural bear market broke out, pulled back, and has tipped higher. I think that's very attractive. And that same story, the mining index on a relative basis, certainly very inexpensive relative to the rest of the market. So not a lot changing. Let's look at technology. Well, this is the XLK, the Select Technology ETF. We put this question mark last week because we had started to see some fading in relative performance. Let's look at it today, a sharp move down in relative strength and a 10.2% pullback over the last 11 days. I think that's a black mark beside tech as lasting leadership unless this changes. Communication services, continued weak relative strength. That's the Twitters and Facebooks of the world. And real estate, as we talked about early on, has had weak relative price performance going back to June of 2020. So there are haves and have nots. The ever important consumer discretionary sector has been the one that's been underperforming the longest since February of 2020 or the beginning of the pandemic. So there are things to own and things to avoid. When we look at the breadth models that we look at from a sector perspective, on the 23rd of June, all of the sectors that we track from a breadth perspective save a couple were in small letters, meaning breadth had been contracting. They were all piled up at this left-hand side of a distribution curve, saying that in each of these sectors, very few as a percent were in uptrends. And when we fast forward to where we were a week ago, a lot of sectors had moved up that curve, meaning more companies were participating. So there was companies that did well during the bounce. But when we look at it today, we can see some changes. 
we can see some of the sectors which had been showing expanding breadth, showing they were in capital letters, are now in small letters again. Biotech, healthcare, internet, software, computers, well, lots of tech, semiconductors. When we looked at the defensives that we've talked about, the staples and the utilities, large letters in green showing strong relative strength versus the market, this is a group we want to own. When we look at uh, electric utilities, a high percentage of stocks performing well, capital letters, meaning the percent of stocks doing well is rising, and strong relative strength versus the market. In financials, Wall Street, that's investment banks. Savings and loans, that's regional banks. And large money center banks, all showing resilient breadth, improving relative strength versus the market. We look at energy, oil service, neutral relative strength, but positive breadth. And again, about 50% of companies participating in the rally. So these are very important tools for us, metals and miners, relative strength versus the market, improving breadth. So we use these tools and we run them every day and we'll continue to look for change. But as it stands right now, we put our money where our mouth is and focus on the groups that we're talking about. Energy continues to be the largest weight in the portfolio. It's up to 18% again. A month ago, it was 13% versus the S&P at a little over four. Industrials would be our next biggest weight. And arguably, a lot of this is defense, or defense companies, but also some transports. Financials and their dividend payers, about 12%, a little over market weight. Utilities, almost four times the market weight. Their defensive characteristics and the dividend yields attached are very attractive. Consumer staples, about a 3% overweight. These are the, the biggest weights in the portfolios. Now, technology a week ago was 10% at 6.4. Group starts to give it back. We start to reduce our weight again. A large position here is Apple. It would be about 4% to 64 And Apple's performing pretty well, but certainly we're way underweight market. We've taken down our government bond position, which likely more or less was short-term bonds we were using as a short-term place to keep some cash. We have healthcare at roughly half market weight. Our materials weight is only 5.5%, but it's twice market weight, and that's up over the past week. We added some, some more uranium. Communication service, very weak, low position. Consumer discretionary, very, un, very low underweight and real estate continued to be in real low underweight. So a combination of basic materials and energy and dividend payers are the majority of the portfolios across the firm. There's important changes afoot. When we look at technology relative to energy, after a short rally early in the summer has given it back. Energy outperforming. Consumer discretionary relative to energy. We've had a number of bounces along the way. This one failed below the moving average and rolled over and headed back south. When we look at the number of companies trading above their 200 day moving average, it's a very stark story. Energy and utilities both have over 90% of the companies trading above long-term trend. That's very favorable. Consumer staples coming in next, materials coming in following that, then industrials. The other end of the spectrum, discretionary and communications, very few companies trading above the 200 day. Outside of North America, Japan continues to outperform. This is a Japanese yen hedged you, a Japanese equity portfolio. We own this in our macro portfolio. And on the other side, on the short side, we are short Europe. The Eurozone stocks particularly hard hit by energy costs and shortages. And Germany as a major manufacturer, again, continues to be sort of the weak link, the weakest link in Europe. Look, these corrections are no fun, but they are a necessity and we have to live through them. There's no crystal ball. We know that from a seasonal perspective, September and August can be difficult months. We are watching our models all day, every day. We retest each of the positions that we own for their fundamental characteristics and their technical characteristics. If things change as they have over the last 10 days in technology, we will pull back our exposures. 
But as it is right now, our key themes continue to hang in well. And we have to remember what happens after these event type crises. The next five years can be very fruitful and we have to be there to participate. So if things should get more difficult through the month of September, we're very happy to get more defensive. The portfolios are hanging in remarkably well so far in the year on a relative basis versus indices and benchmarks. But we're only nine months through. We got three months to go. Please remember that when we looked at years where June and July were very strong, sorry, July and, and August were strong, we tended to have very strong finishes to the year. That remains to be seen. But with that, Pam, if there's any questions, certainly we're happy to answer them. Bob has a question for you, Dave. He wants to know if there has ever been a time when interest rates have gone up and the markets have also gone up at the same time. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> a great question. So um, just the, 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 the simple answer is we compare this period to the period after the Second World War. Because after the Second World War, there was a big surge in demand and an, inel and an inability to supply because so many of the productive assets had been focused on the defense effort. And so there was a two-year period where inflation rose and the Fed rose, raised rates to fight it. Uh, and, uh, and the market went through a brief correction. But frankly, rates rose from 1951 through 1966, 15 years. And during that period, the market had one of the greatest bull markets of all time. When I started the investment business in 1986, it was a common discussion point to say the reason we need to own equities is to offset the impacts of inflation. We need to own companies that can grow their earnings faster than inflation. Now, not every company can, and different companies and sectors are, do well in different types of environments. The types of sectors that we own today, like energy and basic materials, have immediate pricing power when prices go higher. And that has a huge impact on their earnings. Now, the Canadian energy in their, in, in, industry is trading at prices that would reflect about $65 oil. We're at over 90. And if prices were to go to 100 or 110, the profitability is off the charts. In fact, the whole Canadian energy industry could pay out all of its debt in the next 18 months. So markets can do very well during a period of rising rates, and they can do very well in certain sectors. So I encourage you not to get too frustrated with the fact that rates are going higher. We don't want inflation to be off the charts. We'd like to see it more muted, but certainly we think it's less likely we're going back to sort of a zero rate of inflation anytime soon. Dave, a couple more questions here. Sebastian wants to know what your thoughts are on Ethereum. Yeah, Ethereum, you know, uh, continues to trade in a way that's similar to the NASDAQ. Um, it's interesting, um, about two weeks ago, after a pretty good-sized rally, um, it pulled back sharply in one day, and I thought, uh-oh, NASDAQ is going to take it in the teeth. And, and, and certainly that's been the case. Now, you know, Ethereum is a long way off the lows um, and, uh, and, and was acting actually pretty resilient today. It was down at 1.4%, and I think it wound up up about 1% on the day. <clears throat> so maybe there's a message in that, too. Um, Ethereum has uh, the, the change in protocol coming, uh, which will happen in the month of September. So there's some anticipation around that. It's going to be interesting to see how it reacts getting through that because it's a big technology shift and we got to make sure that everything goes according to plan. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that I wouldn't be too focused in this area. Um, I, I, think, I think certainly uh, it bottomed around the time the NASDAQ did actually about a week before. So maybe it's a good, good, good tell. And the, at the end of the day, um, it's a long duration asset like a technology company. So we have to be a little bit careful, uh, but certainly acting better than Bitcoin. If I was going to own one, I'd own Ethereum. Thanks so much, David. Next question. Sanjay wants to know if you have any recommendations on industrials like uranium. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I don't think you have to de- get too cute. Uh, Cameco, I think, looks very attractive. Um, it's outperforming the sector. Uh, it's outperforming. Um, it's outperforming uh, its smaller peers. You know, it's a real company. They're going to have uh, good earnings growth over the next couple of years in the current environment. And of course, if uranium pricing moves higher, uh, I think it's 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 in a great spot. We're at a relative strength new high for the year, trading better than ninety five percent of all the companies in the market. And um, uh, there's lots of leverage in this business. So I, I think that I'd focus on Cameco. I own a little bit of NextGen, which is a smaller cap NXE. Um, which maybe has a little bit more rocket fuel if that's what somebody's looking for. But frankly, the the Cameco is the is the leader in the group. Thanks, Dave. And the next question we have is just a gold prediction or thoughts on gold. <laughs> if you don't want to be um, predicting the future on gold, yeah, for the, <laughs> the long suffering gold investors. Um, you know, I, I think that we probably should be at a place where you see some support in here over the next couple of weeks. Um, the thing that gold does not like is sharply higher rates or a tightening in the system. And so that's been problematic for gold. Um, I think that, you know, if you were to ask me a week ago, uh, you know, I don't think that people expected Powell to be quite as hawkish as he was last week. I think it's probably a good thing that he was, but that certainly, you know, made it difficult on any long duration asset. And, and certainly gold is one of those. So um, I think that you probably can wait and see a turn here when it gets going. Uh, if it gets going, the very long-term price structure is very, very bullish. Uh, once it gets going, it should it should rally a long way. But you know, you might want to wait and see it get a start. Well, Dave, from Max and I, we uh, thank you very much for this great review. He apologizes for interrupting the call (laughs) and uh, we'll leave it at that for today. No more questions. And I'll leave you as always with the final word. Yeah. You know, look, um, let's not get too uh, focused on the small wiggles at the end of August. Let's remember that markets are liquid. There's a ton of people who are away on vacation. Um, This is a time when you can get outsized moves on small amounts of of volume. Uh, So uh, let's keep the lens pulled back and look at the big structural themes. And unless they change, let's stay focused. And so I think that there's some very clear leadership in this market. And frankly, some of the leadership in this market is leadership that wouldn't make sense if you thought the economy was really getting, you know, hurt. So I think that there's some lessons for us in, in what to expect in the economy if more economically sensitive sectors are actually behaving quite well. But clearly the biggest concern that the market has is for the consumer. Uh, And uh, certainly the Fed is trying to keep consumption down and using the bully pulpit to do it. Uh, But let's just remember the seasonality plays its way out over the next four to five weeks. uh, And we wanna be positioned to take advantage of what comes next. So thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll do it again next week. Uh, first week of September, everybody's back to school and back to work. And uh, we'll see how the market behaves once the, all the traders are back. Thanks very much.